the theme was a very, you'd think a theme from Maniac would be some real ultra violent thing, but instead it was a, a, a solo flute type instrument and some strings and very delicate kind of a harpy bell, piano-esque kind of a, a music that sort of hopefully got you into the head of this character and, and made you want to kind of feel sorry for him. That way when he actually did his deed, it wasn't, it was such a contrast that, you know, it, it was manipulative, of course, but that's what music in those kind of genre films has to be. Originally, uh, musically speaking, um, I was a jazz musician and I was writing um, jazz arrangements. I started real early in life, uh, eighth grade, I was writing music and um, I went to college and I have degrees, on a master's degree in music. Um, I went into the Navy during the Vietnam War and became chief arranger with a U.S. Navy band. And that led me to meet various guys who were getting out on the road working with uh, jazz musicians. And so my first uh, um, jazz, professional jazz work was for um, Maynard Ferguson, who was a big jazz trumpet player. And um, so I wrote for him for, I don't know, nine years. And um, uh, eventually moved to New York City, became his producer. And the first album that I produced, uh, we decided to include the music from the movie Rocky on the album. And we updated the, the movie theme and made it more danceable and more jazzy, and it became the hit record version of it. So at 26 years old, I became this jazz um, guru producer guy that they gave a bunch of other instrumental artists to do, um, including um, Gato Barbieri, who did Last Tango in Paris. So my first real film experience was for a Michael Winter film recorded in London with the London Symphony with Gatto playing sax. Sophia Loren and James Coburn are in the film. It was called Firepower. So my credit is listed as um, orchestrator, but in reality I took Gatto's themes and crafted them to fit the, the movie. And uh, it was a great experience. Uh, the big screen opened up at the Wembley uh, recording studio and there's Sophia Loren on the screen and an 80-piece orchestra and I was hooked. So. Well, it was very interesting uh, how Maniac came into my musical life was that I was a producer at CBS Records in New York City. And um, the producer of this film, um, Maniac, came to me, Andy Garoni was his name, and he says, do you think there's any of your artists that would be interested in writing music for uh, this film that I'm, I'm producing? And I had just come back from, uh, or I was just about to go to London to record the Firepower score. And I said, well, I'd like to take a look at it and see. He didn't think I would be interested in doing something like that. So, uh, so we arranged a meeting uh, with Bill Lustig and Andy and the editor in a little tiny editing room. We screened it on a moviola. And uh, I wasn't really a fan of that genre of films, but what got me was the energy of the filmmakers. They were like so uh, gung-ho about what they were doing and, and how they were doing it. And uh, Joe Spinell was there. Um, it was like uh, it was like a family making this film, and they were so excited about this movie that they were doing. I hadn't seen that when I was working on uh, Firepower, and uh, it was more of an industrial type of a atmosphere. So um, I said, you know, I'm really interested in, in doing this. I think I could do this. And they said, oh, really? Have you ever done any horror film? I said, no, I've not really done any films. <laughs> so. Um, but I know how to do it, and I've has, I have a little bit of experience in uh, doing music, um, thinking that, well, maybe they have like a big orchestra or something to make the music for this. Bill is a complete student of film music, and he probably owns every Ennio Morricone score and movie that exists. And so he says, well, you want to do my movie, let's hang out. And um, I went to his apartment, and. We sat there in, in his bedroom for like days watching Morricone scores. And uh, it kind of taught me 
where Bill was coming from in terms of the sensibilities of how he perceived music working with film. And that's stayed with me uh, ever since. And he, he was my, even though he's much younger than I am, he was really my musical theatrical mentor in showing me how music worked with film. easy to do violent, slashy, uh, I shouldn't say easy, but it's fun to do that. But to get inside the head of a, of a psychopath and try to figure out, well, what made him tick? What, what sensibilities did he have that maybe the music could bring out that um, couldn't really be represented in any other way? And in particular, there were scenes in there where um, Joe Spinell is walking past um, windows and shopping malls and like Macy's and stuff and looking at these mannequins and, and the only thing that's going on is the music and him kind of grunting and moaning in his unique kind of a way and the approach to the music became more um, empathy for this character like he must have had a terrible childhood to be that screwed up you know it's like what happened to him and he sort of made you wanted to have some pathos for this guy who then became this ultra-violent, deranged killer. <laughs> there weren't any, like, demos, and there was no mock-ups. It was like, um, they sort of trusted me to do my thing, and much, unlike how it is today when it's completely collaborative. Every, everybody wants to help compose. And they kind of move into your studio and say, uh, well, I think that would sound better if you use an E flat there instead of a D, you know, so I, I kind of preferred working this way. They also didn't have the music, there was no temp music in the score, in the film. So the music was kind of being composed as they were editing the film. There wasn't a complete cut of the film with uh, somebody else's music in to try to sell it or anything of that nature. It was sort of, um, well, here's real one, take that home and start working on it and we're gonna be editing real two and whatever. So it was, um, uh, it wasn't ultra collaborative in terms of them being constantly with me when I was writing, but it was very collaborative in the discussion and conceptual ideas of the score. I played them my ideas and I did demo the theme for Bill and he just loved it. He says I would have never thought of that and um, to do a, we discussed having a gentle approach but it was gentle but it was also pretty warped. Fancy girls and their fancy dresses and that lipstick. Laughing and dancing. I think the most exciting time was then because the the filmmaking was um, the enthusiasm between the director, the producer, the editors, um, the actors was, as I mentioned earlier, it's much more like of a family type um, thing and everybody was so into what they did and so appreciative of what the other crafts would bring to the, the party. Uh, and now it, I find that people were a little more critical of the other crafts um, accomplishments and they're jealous and it's like um, also those films were so independent there weren't um, a quote a studio giving notes on like how graphic the killing should be or what people should wear it was like three or four guys saying well what do you think we should do with this murder and then they would sit around and talk about it and make it be very cool and they didn't have to report to anybody you know, well, how, how far can we take this? Can we really get away with not getting an X rating? Well, how, I wonder what we have to do to not get an X. Or how far can we push the Dolby stereo spectrum and still, still make it playable across America? Um, now there seems to be these committees a lot of times, um, having been in situations like with major studios, there's a lot of non-creative people making what they consider creative decisions. And now, uh, it takes a little bit of the creative edge off of the creators 
And uh, the 80s period, we were all creators. There was no, there were no uh, governing bodies. It was like, well, what do you think? Let's just go out and have some fun and make some great movies. Actually, I haven't seen the film in a while, but I must say that it, it has to be still hugely popular because so far, to my knowledge, it's had six different soundtrack album releases, including one from a company in the Netherlands that actually pressed the film on red vinyl and also pressed a CD that was cut out in the shape of Joe Spinell's face. So um, I'm glad it's still real popular, and, uh, and since it was my first real creative endeavor, I feel that's quite an accomplishment. Thank mm -hmm. you.